We read from the Gospel of John, book 10, verse 1 through 10, chapter 10. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The word of God. Thanks, thank you, God. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would pour through me the words that you would have us hear this day, that they may be your words, not mine, your word, not my opinion, that will touch us where we are at our point of need. And may these words and these meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We pray in your holy name, the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> During the Second World War, Hollywood sought to do their part by producing films that were upbeat, inspirational, utilizing the biggest stars of the day. Uh, there was a film called Going My Way. Anybody know of that? I didn't see it in its first run, by the way. Uh, in the movie, Bing Crosby plays Father Chuck O'Malley. He's a new priest who shows up at rundown St. Dominic's Church that's heavily in debt, the parish of a crusty old priest named Father Fitzgibbon, who was none too pleased with O'Malley's breezy modernistic methods. And Father Fitzgibbon is content to stick to the policies he's followed for nearly 45 years. But O'Malley, he sets to win the confidence of the local street toughs, the kids terrorizing the neighborhood. He wants to organize the boys into an angelic church choir. Imagine this. <laughs> that will make enough money singing concerts to save St. Dominic's from losing everything. Now, in real life, Bing Crosby was a staunch Catholic, and it took some doing to persuade him to play a happy-go-lucky priest. But for those of you who may not be aware of movie musicals at the time, it didn't take much for the screen to erupt in song. But for this movie, the fellow who was the composer was Jimmy Van Heusen. He was given a specific charge and a tough job. The director, knowing what was going on in that moment where the kids were hoping to be reeled in for God's purpose, the director told him that he needed a song that, as he described it, amounted to the Ten Commandments with a rhythm section. Well, Van Heusen was stumped until he visited Bing Crosby's home. And many of you know that in a former life, I produced biographies for the a and &E Network. And the biography of Bing Crosby was one of the most successful. And I was interviewing his son, Gary, and I discovered that Crosby was a disciplinarian. He was a strict disciplinarian. So Van Heusen's sitting in a room over here, and Crosby's in a room over there, just hammering his boys. And finally, out of frustration, he hears this, would you rather be a mule? Well, that was a sign for Van Heusen. He went back and he wrote a song called, Would You Like to Swing on a Star? It was intended to reach the tough kids in the neighborhood. The song won an Academy Award, but now here's a question for all of us. 
What do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to be a mule? Well, the song also asked if you'd care to be a pig or a fish. Now, I'm not certain that the Ten Commandments were served well in this confection of a song, but in a whimsical way, the young, tough kids that Crosby was singing to were tutored. Flexible, not stubborn like a mule. Called to be well-mannered, disciplined, and clean rather than living like a pig. To be truthful rather than slippery as a fish who just gets caught anyway. Today, my question for you is, would you rather be a sheep? You know, sheep often get a bad rap as an animal who would blindly, blithely, and openly be described as dull and stupid and easily led. But is that what our text is really talking about? Not at all. Our text this morning is one of the most familiar in Scripture. In fact, as you've heard, this Sunday is called Good Shepherd Sunday. So let's take a look. You know, it's important to know the context of Scripture, what comes before well, in the passage just before this, Jesus has just infuriated the authorities by healing a man. Really? Healing him on Sunday, on the Sabbath. Now, this man was born blind. In our scripture today, Jesus is just trying to describe who he is to his disciples. And he begins by contrasting himself as a sheep owner to a thief, to a thief who scales the wall of the sheepfold. The owner knows and calls his own by name, and the sheep willingly follow him as he goes before. But when the thief calls, the sheep scatter. But the disciples didn't get it. So, rather than hammer them with the same message, he tries a different imagery. He says, let's try this. I am the gate, and all who enter by me will be saved, will come in and go out and will find pasture. Okay, so Jesus was the owner. Now Jesus says he is the gate. There's a colleague of mine who went to Palestine, and he saw the sheep enclosure, the sheep pen, but he didn't have a gate. And so he asked the shepherd, well, how do you keep the men, or how do they go out? How do you keep wolves out of the way? And he said, I am the gate, because he would lie there at night to keep the sheep in and to keep the danger out. Jesus says, I am the gate, and who enter by me will be saved. Now, this going out and coming in is a Hebrew idiom, and it describes a place of peace where one may feel safe and secure in one's passage in the comings and in the goings of life. So then Jesus says, the thieves, the bandits, we may assume are the false prophets of the day, and they were proclaiming themselves to be the Messiah, and they only came, Jesus says, to steal, to kill. To destroy. But Jesus has come, he says, that they, the sheep, that you and me may have life and may have it abundantly. Now next, the contrast becomes between the good shepherd, the true shepherd, and the hired hand. That's if we continue with that text. The true shepherd being the one who lays down his life for the sheep, the hired hand being the one who will cut and run at the first sign of danger. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He has presented himself as the owner, as the good shepherd, then to the shepherd of multiple flocks. In verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Whew. Scripture has taken us, Jesus is taking us on a on quite a trip of discovery. What is it that we are to take with us on this Good Shepherd Sunday, this fourth Sunday of Easter, 2023? You see, Jesus knows who we are. Jesus knows how we are. Jesus created us. But here in the 10th chapter of John, he goes to great lengths to offer us a number of scenarios that again tell us who he is, that again tells us who we are, that again tells us where we are going and how we're going to get there following our Lord. Well, first of all, who is he? Well, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God incarnate. It's a simple statement. But let's take a look at this. If Jesus is Lord, there is one shepherd who is the shepherd over one flock of beloved, then no one else need apply for the job. Whew, covered. What a relief. 
Second, we are his flock, and yes, his sheep. But what did that mean in ancient Palestine? In our modern era, animals are raised by the thousands and with one purpose, exploitation. What is the best use of, of the animal? What is most efficient and likely to produce the most profit? Would it be wool? Would it be meat? In Palestine, the sheep were raised primarily for wool. So the shepherd cared for these animals over the years and would often have names for them and, yes, would communicate to them in a voice and with a whistle that was known to them and trusted by them. There was an intimacy, a reality of a mutual dependence that circumscribed the relationship between the shepherd and his flock. And we are called to be the one body of Christ. It's only through the radical love of Jesus, Jesus the Christ, that the world can approach unity. Now, this doesn't preclude communities nor denominations that are particular and through which people band together in service. But we, men and women, we who claim Jesus Christ are united by our common love and our loyalty to the living God. So this becomes a personal mission for the people of God. It's a dream of God, a yearning of and for God. God's fondest, fondest wish that we accept the unconditional love that is offered, and yes, and share it. It's our mission, it's our job. People cannot hear unless it is proclaimed. And the sheep of the ultimate flock, the uber flock, will not, cannot be gathered unless someone goes out to bring them. Is the Holy Spirit of God able? Sure. But where does this Holy Spirit of God reside? In your heart. In the hearts, then in the prayers, and then in the actions of you and of me. Dear Second Family, there's a tremendous mission for us beyond our borders. The borders of our nation, our state, the peninsula, our zip code, and within the borders of the property here, as fellow immortals, all of us eternal creatures of God, as brothers and sisters of the same creator, as we seek shelter for the night under the benches and the ramps of our property. Our mission field, men and women, in truth, it's in truth, and it's hemmed in only by the breadth of our heart or the narrow gauge of our love and also by our gratitude to our God that we are loved and our election, yes, Presbyterian, our election, our being chosen by God, not frozen, but aflame with a passion to serve our God and each other. Now, our task is not easy. A politician was describing recently what would be required if his party hopes to retain the offices that it's occupying, and he said this, he said, if we don't prove that we have better solutions, if we don't prove that we're in touch with reality, if we don't prove that we're prepared to do things on the scale that the future requires, then we have no guarantee, nor should we win. And I would say that this is exactly what our God is calling us to do, to prove in our lives and in our love that we have been shown the better way, not a better way, but the better way, that we are in touch with the ultimate reality, Lord Jesus God, and that we are prepared to do that which our God calls us and leads us to do on a scale that the future requires. And that is on a scale that is beyond our doing and our dreaming, if not blessed and ordained by our God. Let's recap. Who is he? He is the way, the sheep gate the portal through which we find purpose and peace, the one whose voice we will know if we but listen, the one who lays down his life by his own obedience, by his own choice, and through his own unconditional love. And who are we? Well, we've been called a lot of things, but I would rather be called and accept God's beloved. And where are we going? Our mission is with Jesus. So tell me, would you like to swing on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar, and be better off than you are? Well, then it's good to be a sheep. Amen? Amen. Amen.